Good morning, everybody. We got lots of time this morning, so I don't know if I'll fill up the time. But that's okay. Last few weeks, we've been going through Romans chapter 8, and for the last few months, of course, the, the book of Romans. And uh, perhaps just a, a quick refresher, the things I've been excited about in looking through this, this book is, is really what the Lord has done for us, the Lord Jesus Christ, when we consider, in contrast, how people of the Old Testament lived and how they related to God. They lived under the law. And the law brought fear because the law pointed out to them that they were sinners. And being a sinner pointed them to condemnation. And that was a a situation of fear for them. But you know, what we see in through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ is that we see that we can have a relationship with the Lord that does not have that fear. Okay, the, past, the Bible says in other places, fear the Lord. And that fear is, is an honor and respect rather than dread. Okay? Now, the law pointed to this moment in time, the crucifixion. And it was a covenant relationship with the people of Israel to preserve them through unto this point. And through the crucifixion, we see some wonderful truths that our old sin nature the nature that we were born with, as Christ was crucified on that cross and that sin was condemned in the flesh, we too were there. And that our flesh nature was also condemned there at the cross. And we are told to account it as to be true. An accounting term. You may not see it, but believe it as absolute truth. That if we acknowledge the fact that we died with Christ and as He was risen, we too are risen with Him in a new life. Although that we are still clothed and in this fleshly tent which is still uh, subjected to the temptation of sin, within us is a new creation born of God. Paul likens this to two natures. He's encouraged the believer to not let your body be used as an instrument of unrighteousness, but rather, through the power of the Spirit, let your body be an instrument unto righteousness. He also developed the truth by using the natural and legal example of one who is married cannot legally go and be married to someone else because that is called adultery. In order for that new union to be made, the old partner must die. And Paul uses this analogy to explain what has happened to the believer. We were bound to the old nature of sin, but through the cross, that old nature died. And therefore, we are free to be united to another. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And having said that, although that we still, as Paul himself noticed, although we still struggle with the sin nature in our flesh, what Jesus Christ has done for us is wonderful in that we are no longer obligated to be bound to that former nature, but he has given us the power to to be freed from that, as, as it says in Romans 8, verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation who are in Jesus Christ, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And we looked at that last week, because Paul said, who will save me from this body of sin? Who will save me from this, from myself, the wretched man that I am? And he says, it is God who will do it. So we will continue today to look at... Um, you know, what this means to be saved in this sense, what does it mean uh, to, to be sons of God? What does it mean to be obligated to the Spirit and not obligated to the flesh? We will be looking more at that today. Now, before I get into that, <coughs> I was reading uh, uh, an interesting section in yesterday's Ottawa Citizen. 
Okay, and one of their um, senior columnists, let's make sure I get his name right here, Robert Sibley, he wrote this very nice essay on vulgarity in our society. Okay? And he's called it Vulgarians at the Gate. And it's interesting, you've got to understand why he felt convicted to write this column. Um, apparently, a couple of weeks ago, or just recently, McLean's Magazine issued a, one of their weekly magazines, and he thought it was kind of strange because here on the cover was this provocatively dressed woman with uh, net stockings on and a thigh-high mini skirt. And he thought, you know, this, this doesn't belong in the news section. This belongs in another section of the news magazine rack. But he, when he looked at it closer, closer, he realized that this was not a woman on the front of the cover, but it was a six-year-old girl. And it had a t-shirt on her that said, Made you look. And the caption on, on the magazine says, Why do we dress our daughters like skanks? Okay, and he felt convicted because he got pulled into the trap. He looked, and he felt convicted about what uh, he, he did. And I think what he wrote, it kind of ties in to what we were going to talk about today, because as Paul wrote this letter of Romans to a culture in Rome and Greek, that culture was rife with flesh nature mentality. They had vulgarness in their society too. We can read in, in history about you know, the Roman orgies and some of the sacrifices they did and temple prostitutes and, and it just goes on and on and on. Our culture too is permeated with this stuff. And as believers, as believers, it makes a particular challenge to us because we are steeped in this culture. And sometimes I think it's hard for us as believers to pull ourselves out of that, to, to make that uh, distinction between what is godly and what is, what is of the flesh. Because a lot of the things that we've been raised in just seem to come to us so naturally. Okay, I just want to read a couple of uh, passages out of here. The term vulgarity as a spiritual disorder that reflects the nihilistic assumptions that man has no other purpose or meaning beyond his animal condition. Right? That's a sin nature. That's, that's the nature we're naturally born into. I'm in good company in making this uh, dismal claim. Vulgarity diminishes us, citizen columnist Andrew Cohen wrote recently. It is everywhere, in dress, in speech, in sports, in popular music, on the airwaves, in newspapers and books. Val Sears, a columnist for the Sun newspaper chain, echoes the sentiment. Vulgarity has become the hallmark of popular American culture in song, television, and print. It has meant that such behavior is normalized and children no longer recognize that behavior May, that may be acceptable in the locker room is not at a party or in class. And just one other one. Elsewhere, too, the worm of vulgarity penetrates our prostrate psyches. Think, for example, if you can tolerate the mental imagery of the labial exhibitionism of the now bald Britney Spears and Paris Hilton, Janet Jackson's look at me wardrobe malfunction of a couple of years ago. Lindsay Lohan's desperate attention-seeking behavior and the sad fate of Anna Nicole Smith, who you know died recently. Miss Smith's life was vulgar, not so much because of what she did, but because of what was done to her. Coming from a poor background and inadequately educated, she used the only thing she had that a sex and celebrity oppressed society valued to go ahead. You have to wonder if towards the end of her life she was aware, however inarticulately, that her life had become a hollow sham, a series of reruns on Entertainment Tonight. Did she feel there was no way out? If Miss Smith is vulgar, then so are all those who watched the television shows devoted to her and bought the tabloids to read about her. <coughs> Very interesting article. Um, if anybody wants to read that, let me know. I can, I'm sure I can share it. 
that Ottawa Citizen article really painted the picture of our society. And this author is right. We live in a vulgar society. It is rife with sin-like behavior. Our culture is steeped in it. And the thing I like there is what he described as, it's our animal behavior. Animal behavior. And that so well describes what Paul is trying to talk about, your flesh. It's what comes naturally to you. Your, your personal desires, those sinful desires. And you think about all the people that, that I mentioned in here, the, the celebrities of today. What becomes of them? Sure, for a while they get money, fame. But you know, a hundred years from now, what will it matter to them? And that's diminishing. But really, when you think about it, in the kingdom of God, what value does this have? Absolutely no value at all. And it's sad. Because so many people run headlong into this realm looking for fulfillment. But it only leads to death. It only leads to death. As again, I said that... Uh, you know, Paul had to deal with a similar problem in the culture that he was in. Okay, so let's read what Paul is saying about uh, the position of the Christian, both in Roman times and in our times. I'm going to begin reading at verse 12, chapter 8. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. As for many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba. Father, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. There's a, there's a battle that Paul talked about at the end of chapter 7. The old nature, the flesh nature. You see, because we are still in this fleshy tent, aren't we? The people I'm talking to, if you can hear me, you are in a flesh, fleshly body. And although the cross it is rendered ineffective, that it's been put against the cross, and in a sense it's dead, and that the new us inside is freed from that, we still live within this fleshy tent that is susceptible to the temptations of sin. The day will come when we will be freed from this. That's the good news. But you know, if you, you can tell a test from experience that sometimes it's just hard to break away from the things that we do so naturally. There's a, a story from a book called Dynamic Preaching. And it says this, There's a true story about a TV announcer who had been doing coffee commercials for several years. Then he changed sponsors. This time, he was doing a commercial for a cigarette company. On camera, for the first new commercial, he took a long draw on his sponsor's cigarette, blew a big smoke ring, looked into the camera and said, Man, that's good copy. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> Just doing the things of the old nature is very, very hard to break, and we can attest to that. Okay, But there's a serious comment here that Paul makes. And he's saying about... Just make sure I've got my, my uh, notes right here. He says that we are a debtor. Okay? And just hold on a minute. Something is missing from my notes. But I think it's okay. I'm pretty sure I can carry on. Yes, I can. Something's happened here. Someone stole part of my notes. Okay. <clears throat> That's okay, though. 
Paul says that we are debtors. Some of your translations may say that we have an obligation. Okay, I don't know what translation you have. Now, that's an interesting word because, you know, to the person who believes in a, in a works-rich type salvation, they would agree with that. Yes, we're debtors. We owe God this. You know, we're obliged to do this. We must do this. On the other hand, someone who believes in extreme grace may find some sort of exception to that. It's like, no, no, we're, we're saved free. We don't have to be conformed to anything. But I think the sense that Paul is trying to say here is that we have been bought by a new master. Okay, and it's only right that we should serve that new master. You know, the Lord said in the Gospels, do you remember where he said, you cannot serve God and mammon? Okay, really what's being talked about here is the contrast between the flesh nature and, and God's nature. Now, we've often been told that mammon is money. Uh, I would say that mammon, or money, I should say, is what we often use to measure mammon. Mammon came from an old God's name, and essentially what it means to someone who heard that word is that it is the idea that I can assert my own security and welfare by my own efforts. Okay, so I'm my own God is really what that says. And Jesus says, you can serve God and serve yourself at the same time. You are either going to be a debtor to one or the other. One of the two is going to be your master, but you can't do both. And so what Paul is saying, it says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. You see, we have a new nature. The one who has bought us out of that old slavery is our new master now. And it's only right that we should serve him. Okay? Because the warning is that the wages of sin is death, Paul has already said. And he says, if we are, we are not to serve that flesh nature, we are not to live according to that flesh, because in there only leads to death. Nothing of use to God. Okay? But righteousness is everlasting life, of course. Okay? Now, now I put up the screen. I hope you can see this. I wanted to sort of give an overview of all of what Paul's talking about that we've uh, learned so far. Now, here it is. Looking for the pointer. Okay. We can just go on an overview here, over on the left-hand side, maybe up here in the corner. This would be the creation, okay? And, of course, eternity goes for eternity past. At some point, God creates mankind in his image. Remember that term, his image, in his likeness. Soon after that, mankind is deceived. And, and the deception is that, you know, you can make your own decision. You can be your own God. You don't need God to, uh, to tell you what to do. He's only going to do that for his own evil purposes, right? So Adam and Eve decide on their own that they're going to do what's best for them. And so they do not trust God. They, they fail to have faith in God. They, they have faith in Satan's story instead. And comes the fall of mankind. Now this is death. You can see i got this blue band up here. That's God's life, eternal life. And down here we have this red band that's our fallen nature, our fallen life. That is death, essentially. And in the Hebrew sense, we see a separation here. And in the Hebrew thinking, that is what death is. It's a separation from God. Now, down in uh, the bottom line here, this is what happens. Okay, so during the fall, we forsake life and enter into death. We're separated from God. But you know, God still loves mankind and he's always looking to, uh, to save them. Even right in the garden, there is a promise of a deliverer. You remember when God says to, uh, he's saying to Adam and Eve and he's specifically speaking to Satan, he says that a seed will come from the woman that will conquer you, Satan. Okay, that seed is a promise of a deliverer for mankind. Later on, we see that through Abraham, Faith is the way to obtain righteousness from God. 
And we see that this point in time is before law, before works. And even there in the promise that God made to Abraham, he said, through your seed shall the nations of the world be blessed. Right? Later on comes the law. And again, this is the covenant between God and his particular people. And they point to the cross. Now, at this point in in history, as we move along the chart, we have the crucifixion. The Lord Jesus comes. The promised deliverer comes to earth and dies on a cross. Now, here, something wonderful happens. There is an opportunity for both Jews and Gentiles who accept and believe what God has said about His Son, that righteousness by faith is through the promised seed, and that His death was substitutionary for ours, and through there, we have access back to eternal life. Okay? Now, what happens here is what we've talked about. This is this whole idea called identity truths. That we acknowledge that we have died with Christ and we are risen with Him in newness of life and therefore we have the body of sin is condemned and we have a spiritual rebirth and we become sons of God. Now having having that, we have a new nature in us and that's what is being encouraged to us as believers by Paul in this passage. That we are to serve that new master. There is where the obligation is. Not down here, but rather up here. Paul is also saying that if we just continue in the nature of sin, where does this lead? Non-believers, it leads to the lake of fire. Eternal separation from God. Okay? Now, the thing that's uh, wonderful and, and the thing we want to try to emphasize on here is what happens for the Christian and what is the encouragement. Through spiritual birth, we are dead to the old nature. We are born anew. We are born of God. We are a child of God. And if we are a child of God, then we will be sons of God. And with sonship comes inheritance. And everything that is available to us will become available to us at one point in time. So if you are a believer, you are a debtor. You have an obligation. But it's an obligation out of willingness. Okay, It's not uh, an obligation of tyranny. It's not an obligation where you are forced. It's an obligation out of willingness to our new master to our Heavenly Father. God purchased us from our former master, and as a result, we do not need to fulfill the desires of that master anymore. We're freed from that. All work for that master only leads to death. Okay? That's kind of an overview. Now, the next passage I want to look at talks about fear. It says, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God, verse 15 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear. Now, why is Paul saying this? Why is Paul saying this? As a slave, you didn't have any freedoms. As a slave, you were just simply the property of a master. And he could do with you whatever he wanted to. And, and because there were no rights for you in a lot of cases, if you messed up, if you didn't do anything right, say you, you, you messed things up, you lived in fear because of the condemnation that would come from your master. Perhaps it was because you didn't do something right. Perhaps it's because you didn't do enough. And in a lot of ways, for the For the human being who lives in the system of sin, they feel the same thing from their master, sin. In the one sense, okay, sin seems fine for a while. The Bible says, yes, sin is fun for a season, but its end is death. 
We think of poor Miss Nicole here. You know, the tragedy of her life ended suddenly. And at the end, I don't think she had a very nice life at all. I bet she felt used. I bet she felt empty. Sin is not a good master. Now, on top of this, when we add the law in place, what does the law do, as we've already discussed? The law magnifies sin. And the law points to condemnation. So when you are not doing something right, there's the law saying, you're wrong, you're a sinner, you're condemned. If we don't do enough, the law says, you're not doing enough, you failed, you're condemned. Now Paul says this, trying to make the distinction. Yes, we've talked about this idea that you have been freed from one slave and been made slave to another. Paul used the example, you have been saved from the slavery of sin, but has, have been now made a slave of righteousness. But the distinction that Paul really wants to make is that it's not going from one evil taskmaster to another. It's much better than that. And here he changes the 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 idea from going from uh, a slave in, under sin to be brought into one's family. Okay? A much better situation. Okay? Because if you thought of, think of only the one condition. Say you're in the slave market. You know, there's one slave master. He's just had it with you. He's whipped you so hard and he can't get anywhere else with you. So he's going to sell you because you're Useless to him. So you go to the slave market and you're thinking, boy, I can't wait to get rid of that guy. But then you find out you're sold to another slave master and maybe he's no better. Perhaps he's even worse. And Paul wants to encourage the believer that this is not the case for the believer because the Lord is not an evil taskmaster. Okay? Now, he has made us sons. Sons. Now, what does that mean? Now, I got two pictures up in here. One, he says that we are children of God, and he also describes us as being sons of God. And I think we have to take a moment to describe what the difference between them is. Now, as a child, a child is one who is an offspring, one naturally born of that person particular parent. Okay? Many here have kids. They're your kids. They're born from you. They are your children. But as a child, a child only has certain limits of responsibility and authority in a family, and they have different attributes. First of all, you think of how Paul put this, we cry, Abba, Father. In our, mature, in, in our immaturity, we cannot articulate fully as an adult, as an adult should. So we cry out a father. Babies cry. They can't articulate. They're immature. They are horrendously dependent. As we are children of God, we are horrendously dependent upon our Father in Heaven to see us through this life. Okay? They are limited but they are offspring. And in that sense, as believers, because we are born again, because we have this new creation in us, this spiritual creation, we are God's children in that sense. However, there is a distinction between that and a son. Okay? Now here's a picture from the Boer War of uh, father and son. The only real difference between them is dad has a mustache and, well, maybe son can't grow one yet. I don't know. But anyways, a son is someone who has been brought into a unique situation in the family, in relationship to the father. They come with much of the authority that the father does. The son would have a similar outlook on life as the father. When we saw in the beginning, in the creation, the Lord says, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. 
and you've probably heard me use this uh, description before, is that that idea of image is very close to the idea of sonship. And it is used in the sense that if the one created or the one born is in the image of the Father, they are in every way a representative of the Father. The best analogy I've heard is that if you had a king of a nation and he had a son, say there had to be some diplomatic need to go to another country, that king could send his son in the king's image. Because everything that you see in the son, you will see in the king. He thinks the same way. He has the same authority, the similar power. Everything that is in the father is in the son. And that's why I picked this picture, because they're both dressed the same, they're about the same height. They're obviously fighting side by side in the Boer War. They're obviously tied into the same purpose. And that is a son. The other interesting thing that we see in this passage is this word adoption. Now, adoption was not a custom of the Hebrews and the Jews, but it was quite prevalent in Greek and Roman culture. And it's because of that, I'm sure, that Paul actually uses this this, uh, example. To be adopted simply means that you are brought in as a family member, but without the natural means of being there. Okay, And, And we still have adoption today. And so, although it is unlikely that we as sinful man would become children of God, there's the unnatural connection. God has done it. He has adopted us to be sons. And so, as we saw in the beginning, God created mankind to be in his image. What is God doing through Christ at the cross? He is forming the transformation. He's making the transformation to change us into his image. That we will be sons, co-heirs with Christ. Okay? And I think that's a neat thing. Because if you look in Ephesians, in the first chapter of Ephesians, what does it tell us there? That as believers, we have all the blessings in the heavenly places. We are accepted. We are there with God. Okay, we don't see that. That's yet to come. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? Okay? So I hope we get that straight, the idea of sons and children, okay? And that we have a great inheritance. And so to bring out the contrast, isn't this much better than just being sold to another taskmaster? We're just not, we're just, not just a slave to God, although Paul used that analogy. We're just not something without rights in a sense. He's made us sons, co-heirs with Christ, to inherit a great inheritance, Okay, so how does this work? Okay, let's go back to the cross. Let's go back to the cross. A lot of this is review, of course. But you know what? It all starts off with justification. And being made right before God. And again, it's kind of attached into the promise that was made to Abraham, wasn't it? Abraham believed God. And because of that, God deemed him as being righteous. Okay? It was by faith. And through the same means, and we've looked at this, that we today are justified by faith. We look at the cross, and we see Christ there. And we see him as the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And when we trust that and believe that, we are there with him. But Jesus has taken the penalty of sin for us so that we don't have to face it. And so through justification, we have freedom from the penalty of sin. And the thing I find so amazing is is that's just the door to get into a realm that is so much greater. Because the issues that Paul has been talking about from the end of Romans chapter 6 up to now, he has been dealing with the issue of sanctification. And sanctification is the process by which we shed away the flesh nature and yield to the Spirit. 
so that through life, through circumstances, through trials and tribulations, there is this struggle. And if we yield to the Lord, the Lord will take those fleshy things that get in His way and He will remove them so that His Spirit will shine through more and more and more. The sanctification process is a process by which we are being transformed into the purpose that we were designed to do. And that's sanctification. And Christ does that through us when we identify the fact that we've been crucified on the cross with Him and raised again. Okay? And this is why all the exhortation has been to look unto Jesus. Put your mind in the heavenly places. Don't focus on the world. Don't focus on the law. Focus on the Spirit of God. And so sanctification, through sanctification, we have freedom from the power of sin. Even in this passage it says, you have an obligation, but you are not obligated to listen to the former taskmaster anymore. You have been freed from that. You do not have to follow your sinly desires. You do not have to listen to your fleshly desires because sanctification has freed you from that. As we continue on in, the, in this chapter of Romans chapter 8, Paul is now introducing the next sta- step, the next phase, and that's glorification. Glorification. Where when we leave this world, we are freed from this flesh tent and we're given a new body and and, and all that wonderful stuff. And at that point, we have freedom from the presence of sin forever. You know, when you look at it, you see this whole model with Jesus on the cross. He is nailed to the cross after the wrath of God has been poured on Him for the sin of the world. And then he dies. He dies to it. Sin is condemned in the flesh. But he is raised again in a new life. And then he is resurrected. You see it? He pays the penalty of sin. He has, the, he has freedom from the power of sin because he was able to be raised. And as he is raised, he is delivered from the presence of sin forever. He's no longer in the world in that sense. Okay? So there is where the Lord leads us. And this is the whole idea of full sonship. And this is our inheritance. Okay? So, just think of of an application here. Our Savior, our Lord, is not an evil taskmaster. But we have a relationship. We have a father-son relationship. We do not have a master-slave relationship. I believe Paul is wise in the way he's progressed this argument that it is much more accurate to call it a father-son relationship. The obligation that we talked about, again, ideally, it is not uh, an obligation under duress. It is an obligation through willingness. Is that where our mind should be? Okay. Wouldn't it be easier if our mind and our desire is to serve the Lord, to see things His way? Doesn't it make to do all the things that are morally in His character that much easier to do when we are in complete agreement with the Lord rather than trying to be fleshly but only serving the Lord, doing the things the Lord wants because if we don't, we're going to get it? Which one's the better way to go? See, if we have the mind of the flesh, our desire is to do things of the flesh. And to do the things of the Lord is so unnatural to us. And our struggle to do so is born out of fear and condemnation for not complying. However, if we have the mind of God, His attitude, and His moral character, our natural instinct then is to do what is right in His eyes. And it's not a struggle at all. We are thinking and doing what we are designed to do naturally. Spiritually naturally. I should use that term. Okay? Our time is gone.